Get in, nerds, we're playing Stellaris. Um, I'm just gonna take some time today to explain kind of how the Stellaris' economy works so that you can understand what I'm about when I talk about resource tiers and, and all that sort of business. Um, so basically, the building blocks of Stellaris' economy are these resources up here. And there are a bunch. Um, but I divide them basically into three tiers. Uh, tier 1, which consists of energy credits, minerals, and food, over here. Tier 2, consumer goods and alloys. And then Tier 3, which is unity and research, and also ships. Um, there's also these capacities over here, and then there's the strategics. Um, I'm going to get into that a little later. But for the moment, let's talk about the simple stuff. The Tier 1 resources are energy credits, minerals, and food. Um, if you look at the breakdown of my current empire's uh, food, uh, energy credit intake and out uh, and spending, uh, revenue and spending, you'll see a couple of things. Um, most of our energy credits are produced by jobs, uh, but there's a large proportion produced also by stations and by trade, and then they're consumed by colonies ship maintenance, station maintenance, starbase maintenance, building maintenance, district maintenance, pops, and by paying leaders. So energy has a lot of uses, um, but as you can see here, the primary one is to sustain stations, buildings, and districts, which we're gonna get into a little later. Um, but that's energy credits. You get them from stations, you get them from jobs. And I'm going to explain jobs in a second. Um, minerals, you mostly get them from stations and jobs. And the primary thing you spend them on, on in a passive sense, is on jobs. And this is on those jobs which produce the tier two resources, consumer goods, and alloys. However, there is a sort of hidden cost here. Uh, the primary thing you're actually going to spend the great majority of your minerals on, I would say, or at least that, this is the case for me, is construction of new buildings and new districts. So, seeing that, uh, we can see that this, while this appears to be a, a tier one economy that heavily weighted towards minerals, it's really not. Because most of my, the outflow of minerals from my economy is not into this this consumed by jobs here it's actually into one one shot building costs which aren't really like they're one shot but they're going to continue throughout the course of the game um and then finally there's food it comes in from jobs uh you can't you basically can't uh produce food from stations or star bases um although you sort of can um and then it's spent uh, eaten by pops um, food is basically the simplest resource to manage. As your population goes up, it will, uh, the cost will increase, and you'll need to devote more pops to, uh, to harvesting it. But to Gen Cat, what are pops? And that's going to lead us into, that's, that's a good question, that's going to lead us into, uh, our, our sort of more in-depth discussion of how you get resources. Pops are population units. Um, I'm going to unflag that, um, and I'm going to explain sort of what they do and how they work. Um, so a pop is a unit of population. As you can see, this world is mostly uh, people pops with uh, a small number of robots as well. Uh, it's about three quarters people pops and one quarter robots. In fact, it's exactly that. Great. Um, I'm going to open this workers tab so that you can see kind of what I've got going on here. These are our Quipo Pops, they're using the Snailian model. And these are our robots, they use the, uh, I want to say, the Cephalopod robot model. Um, so Pops are units of population. Units of population produce resource for, resources for you by occupying jobs. Uh, and jobs are produced by buildings and districts. And remember, buildings and districts are also going to have themselves and upkeep cost in energy credits. So, 
districts are over here, buildings are over here. Um, there are four basic types of districts. Inter uh, generator districts, which produce technician jobs. Those jobs produce energy. Mining districts, which produce mining jobs, and those jobs produce minerals. And then finally, agricultural districts, which produce farming jobs, and those jobs produce food. Now, if you've been paying close attention, you'll also notice that each of these resource districts, is what I call them, uh, also produces two housing. So they produce the necessary housing for the pops working in them. But they don't produce an excess of housing to house pops that are going to work in building type jobs that don't have housing associated with them. For this, you will mostly need city districts. City districts produce a small amount of jobs. Uh, one in the base game, they produce a clerk job. Um, and five housing in the base. These have been upgraded through technology, so they produce two and six, but um, in the in when you start the game, uh, city districts are only gonna produce one job, so half as much as the other districts, but they produce six housing, which you can use to house additional pops. Um, all three, all of the types of jobs which work in districts are, uh, are, are, are worker tier jobs. So these are these are working people. They are they are your your baseline average citizens. Um, most buildings, however, do not produce worker tier jobs. They produce either ruler tier jobs or specialist tier jobs. Um, and we'll get into what tier means a little later. But basically, and it is it is these jobs that convert the basic resources into the middle tier resources and the middle tier resources into the top tier resources. So, um, for example, civilian industries have a uh, produce consumer goods, and you will notice that these jobs have an upkeep. What that means is that this, the two jobs that are being produced in, these bu in this building, the two artisan jobs, what they do is they consume minerals and they turn them into consumer goods. So, uh, as a result, you need to be careful with your tier two, uh, with, with what buildings you produce because those are going to put a dent in your uh, mineral production. Same here with this alloy foundry. It consumes 12 minerals in uh, both of those metallurgist jobs, and by the way, metallurgist jobs, and produces six alloys. Now, just to be clear, when I say those metallurgist jobs produce, uh, consume 12 minerals and six alloys, it's not each. Uh, and this will always show you the summation of all of them for this building. Same with this one. Um, and then there are buildings that consume tier two resources to turn them into tier three resources. One example of that is this monument here, which consumes consumer goods and creates unity and society research. Uh, these research complexes, which, pr which consume consumer goods and produce just research of every kind. This gene clinic, which consumes a small amount of consumer goods and produces pop growth as well as amenities. That's a a, a, a planet-wide tracked value that determines uh, has an effect on planet happiness. And this robot assembly plant that consumes alloys and produces robot population growth. Um, population growth is what leads to there being new pops. And it is not an exaggeration to say that in Stellaris, population growth is the lifeblood of the Stellaris economy. Um, this is... Our, our growing population, these are people that are growing naturally all by themselves, and you can see the many and various bonuses that this civilization provides them. We're providing a total of plus 60% through our various civics and technologies and traditions, and that is uh, bringing the pop growth up to 4.8 per month. Uh, once that bar, which is currently on 1 out of 100, reaches 100, uh, a new pop will be created. Similarly, this uh, robot, uh, the, the robot assembly plant is producing uh, from the two jobs, from the, the, the ro two jobs? Is it two? It's only one. Did I, did I mistake that? Yes, it's only one roboticist job. Um, is assembling, is producing two assembly worth of robot population growth. So we got, we're at 30 out of 100 right now, and each month, 2.2 uh, is going to go into it, and when it reaches the end, a new robot pop is going to be produced. 
So that's the basic mechanics of pop growth. So each pop is employed in one of these jobs, which are provided by these buildings. And as you can see up here, most of our, uh, most of our, our, in fact, I think all of our specialists are people pops. None of them are robots. Um, I th believe at this moment, my society does not have the capability to have uh, robots do certain types of jobs. Um, but you know, that will, that will change later. So basically what does all this add up to? Uh, it adds up to the realization that you need to, the, the goal of economy management in Stellaris is making sure that these, that these basic resources stay, stay stable. Uh, energy credits and food are stable and minerals continue to grow so that you can continue to produce what you want for your empire to grow. And what you choose to spend your tier one and tier two resources on will have, will be the primary determinant of what your empire will be good at. Um, for example, if I've got an excess of consumer goods that I'm, uh, that I have because I'm spending a bunch of minerals creating consumer goods, I can then spend them. Uh, I can, I can build a research lab that will cause those consumer goods to be spent on research, which will allow my empire to advance in tech. Or I can create monument jobs, which will primarily output unity, which will allow my empire to advance in traditions. Um, or on the other hand, I could, I could instead of consumer goods, uh, be producing alloys, which would allow me to assemble additional robots, but more more commonly, and for all empires, it would allow me to produce ships here at my starbase, which would allow me to grow militarily. Um, while growing tech is one way you can grow militarily, uh, by increasing your tech level and eventually building and upgrading your ships to higher level and uh, with more potent uh, military equipment, um, the primary way you're going to increase uh, your capabilities militarily is to produce more ships. Um, so that's the way the balance works there. And there are other sort of, they're not resources in the traditional sense of being up here on this hot bar, but there are other resources, uh, at play here. Um, to give an example is population growth, which we were discussing earlier. That's a resource. Um, and if you want to increase your population growth, either through uh, genetic healthcare with these medical workers or robot assembly, it will cost you tier two resources. Um, so that is something that you have to be aware of. Also, you need to be aware that all buildings have uh, an upkeep cost. You can see that down there under plan, there's the name of the building, the planetary limit, the production time and mineral resource cost, and below that is the upkeep. That's generally energy. Um, so every every building and district has an energy cost. Uh, districts are generally very cheap to support. Um, resource districts are, are one energy each. City districts are two. Buildings are much more. Um, gene clinics are two. Uh, civilian industries and alloy foundries are two. Uh, this robot assembly plant is five. This government building is five. Um, and I think an even larger government building will be more. This one's eight, for example. Produces uh, a large number of jobs, uh, two enforcer jobs, one noble job, and two administrator jobs. Um, normally, planetary capitals don't produce noble jobs, but I have a special civic that causes them to do so. Um, and it is these jobs produced here in the planetary capital and here at the noble estates, as well as through a tradition that I have that produce my ruler tier pops. These administrators, which have, uh, which don't consume any resources and produce unity. These nobles, which produce unity and stability. These administrators produce amenities and, and unity. Uh, and these merchants that produce amenities and trade value. Um, but there is a hidden cost. It's not hidden, hidden. It's just not quite as obvious to producing a lot of ruler tier pops. And that is that they consume additional consumer goods. Um, the consumer goods allocation for each pop, which is the sort of the, the stuff they need the, to, to live and enjoy life, the, the, the bits and ends, the, the, 
the appliances and the water, electricity, and Wi-Fi. Not the electricity, that's energy, but you know what I mean. Um, that's represented by consumer goods. And what consumer goods each... Uh, so it's determined by tier based on an allocation from your policy, or from your policies, from your species rights. Um, you'll see from my Quipple Pops, we are doing uh, decent conditions. We could also institute social welfare or uh, set up academic privilege. Here's, but here's how I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you what that does. Under decent conditions, which is the default for most empires, um, rulers consume one consumer good per month, Specialists, 0 0.5. Workers, 0 0.25. And slaves, 0 0.05. Excuse me, obviously in any, situ any, any civilization which uses slavery, slaves are, generally speaking, treated very poorly. Not as poorly as they would be under a stratified economy where they would cost no consumer goods at all. Um, and what your, your policy is will affect who is happy in your civilization. So this one, for example, um, grants a, a, a small happiness bonus to rulers and a, a very small happiness bonus to specialists, but then uh, it increases the political power of rulers and specialists significantly. If I were to go to academic privilege, so the difference here, remember, uh, decent conditions is one consumer good for rulers, half for specialists, 0.25 for workers, that, the difference with that in academic privilege would be uh, increasing specialist costs up to the same amount as rulers. Uh, and it would produce a happiness bonus for both. And it would create a small increase in ruler political power, but a large, large increase in specialist political power. So that represents the idea that a society which practices academic privilege allocates great uh, political power and uh, high living standards to these specialist pops. Researchers, metallurgists, enforcers, artisans, entertainers, culture workers, bureaucrats, roboticists, and medical workers. And political power is sort of an odd duck of a, of a system, and I'm probably going to not leave that. It's generally not as much something you need to worry about um, in, in most situations where you're at peace. Um, although it can get hairy later with other stuff. Um, but that's, I think, the basics of the Stellaris economy. So when I talk about stabilizing my economy, I mean getting out of the red. Um, because if you're in the red, you can potentially run out of a thing. And if you run out of a thing, the consequences are quite severe. If you run out of energy credits, there is a large production penalty to, I believe, all of your buildings and districts. Uh, if you run out of minerals, you effectively cannot grow and will eventually be crushed under the weight of your unemployed pops. They will start to flee your civilization, basically. If you cannot uh, produce enough food to feed your pops, you will get a large happiness and uh, obviously a very large population growth uh, penalty. If you cannot produce sufficient consumer goods, that will be a happiness penalty. And if you I don't have alloys. I forget what that does. I've never had that happen. It's very rare to run out of alloys because, as you can see here, there's so little that costs alloys in the long term. Um, alloys are like uh, minerals in this way. You're mostly spending them on large single uh, investments, which is to say ships. Um, so it's rare to have negative alloys. I'm excluding this influence here, uh, and the reason I'm excluding that is because none of what I've talked about produces influence. Influence growth is generally more or less stable in the course of a game of Stellaris, increasing only kind of right at the end when you get access to a, spe a special use of unity. So, what's the point? So, what do you, what's the point of this? What do you want to build? Well, alloys let you produce ships, and ships are the lifeblood of your military. As you can see here, I have access to a number of different ship types, including the smallest, the Corvette, the second smallest, the Destroyer, the medium-sized one, the Cruiser, as well as uh, civilian ships here, the construction ship, which builds stations and star bases, the colony ship, which colonizes planets, and the science ship, which, sh which surveys systems. All of these are going to be needed for, for growth, but in the early game, you're primarily going to spend 
your allies on civilian ships, assuming you're not trying to get into an early fight, which some of you are, and I respect that decision, although in this playthrough I'm not going to be doing that, uh, as you will see once you see the, the, the game kind of getting started. I am kind of spoiling some of this, but I, I think you're paying attention to the stuff that matters here. Um, on the other hand, uh, research will go into technologies, like these ones, that will both give you new capabilities and increase the capabilities that you already have. For example, um, when you are uh, in physics research here, you can get a, uh, a tech called field modulation, and this is increases the amount of energy credits that are produced by technicians. Um, Administrative AI increases research speed. Zero gravity laboratories increases the uh, output of research stations. So all of that's what research is for. And obviously up here you can see uh, military technologies as well. And it's similar all the way through that. Um, t uh, technology is also, research is also used for projects here in the situation log, such as this one. Um, and those consume that research. So that's one path to growth uh, and to consume your, uh, into consuming your, your goods to produce benefits for your civilization. It is also, I would say, a, uh, a very important part of growth when you're playing a tall civilization that's not very large. Tall and wider concepts in strategy gaming, basically tall means small number of planets, large population, in this context, wide means very highly distributed, uh, constantly founding new colonies and such like as that. Um, on the other hand, Unity lets you unlock traditions, which give you powerful long-term bonuses. For example, here you have the expansion tradition. Uh, when this bar gets to the end, I'll be able to hit adopt on one of these new tradition trees. And then once the tradition tree has been adopted, I'll be once the bar gets filled, this will consume all these unity that I produced, and uh, I'll be able to start building it up again. And once it gets to the end again, I'll start adopting these policies. Um, so traditions give you long-term benefits. Um, the harmony tradition, for example, uh, each tradition tree has an adoption effect and a finisher effect. Uh, the, the adoption is when you get it. The finisher is when you get all of the text in it, all of the uh, traditions in it. And then when each finishes, it gets you a powerful ascension perk, which are very large bonuses, which kind of shape the, 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 the path of your civilization. Um, so as you can see here in the harmony tree, we've got things like mind and body, which increases base leader lifespan, um, the greater good, which increases governing ethics attraction, utopian dream, which increases stability on all planets, and this powerful one, bulwark of harmony, which increases build speed for our ships, and uh, ship fire rate in our own borders while we are in a defensive war. Or sorry, I think ship fire rate in our own borders is, is doesn't matter what kind of war we're in. Um, so this is another way you can get yourself powerful long-term bonuses that are in competition with, on a certain level, the technological bonuses you'll gain from research. So that's the basics of it. Um, you want to... Actually, that's not quite the basics. I want to talk about how planets grow. When you first colonize a new planet, which I'm doing here, this planet has zero pops. Uh, it's a little difficult to tell, but it has zero districts, and it doesn't even have the space where the uh, buildings would be, because it doesn't have any buildings. It's in the process of being colonized. Once it is colonized, it will pop one to three pops. Uh, it's not random, it's determined by various things. There is a tradition in the expansion tree over here that increases the number of pops you start with on a new colony, and then there's a special relic you can get that increases that. Um, and that's when the population starts to grow, and you start building districts to employ those pops. As populations get higher, uh, you will eventually start to have building slots. Um, the first slot is all in a colony is always occupied by a converted ship, uh, a converted colony ship, which creates uh, settler pops. 
that will eventually be converted into a planetary, that will eventually be able to be converted into a planetary administration once you reach 10 pops. Um, but you won't have any building slots to start with. These are gated behind the number of pops you have. Uh, every five population gives you one additional uh, building slot. So in the early game of Solaris, while you can build as many districts as you want, you're very, very restricted with your one world on how many uh, buildings you can have, even though your one world starts with a pretty significant population and will, will pop some new building slots pretty quickly after you start playing the game. So, in the early game, the struggle is to have enough buildings producing Tier 2 resources that you can start outputting more of the Tier 3 resources that matter, especially with the continued growth of your population often putting a strain on your civilian industries, and the continued building of star bases to claim new systems consuming most of your alloys. But as you get on towards the mid-game, you'll start to get, and this is what an empty building slot looks like, uh, but as you get on towards the mid-game, you'll start to get more uh, more breathing room on that side, and you'll be able to do what I call weighting your economy upwards. You see, in the early game, because you have such limited building slots, most of your, your pops are going to be employed in working to your jobs, producing these basic resources. However, as you get to later in the game, you'll produce more civilian industry and alloy foundry buildings to produce these tier two resources, and eventually be able to build a large number of buildings that will produce tier three resources, like these administrative parks, which produce uh, administrative capacity, which I'll get to a little later um, once I've talked about the sort of the, the, the capacities here. Um, and an economy that is outputting a high amount of, that is employing a disproportionate number of its pops producing unity or research or uh, naval or administrative capacity is a a top-heavy economy and such economies can often place strain on your basic resources um, so when I when I talk about balancing my economy I'm talking about getting out of the red but I'm also talking about ensuring that my pops are employed in the type of jobs that I need them to be employed in in order for my civilization to be successful um, one more thing I want to go, uh, two more things I want to go over. First, it, there's capacities. Um, there are a bunch here, but uh, the main ones that are affecting your economy are, envoys is not part of that, are uh, administrative capacity, starbase capacity, and naval capacity. And starbase capacity only to a certain extent. Administrative capacity represents the basic ability of your empire to administer itself and to allocate resources success successfully. And uh, it is weighed against something called sprawl. As you can see here, there's a base of 30 administ My administrative capacity is 516 and my sprawl is 429. That's it's represented by the over and under here. Um, my administrative capacity, the base is 16. Colonial bureaucracy plus 10, that's a technology. Um, I'm getting 5% bonuses from the Adaptive Bureaucracy and Effective Bureaucracy Technologies. I'm getting a 20% bonus from the Imperial Prerogative Ascension Perk. I'm get, and I'm getting a 15% bonus from the Isolationist Diplomatic Stance. So that's providing me with a total of, of a 45% bonus to administrative capacity. But, the, but as you can see here, looking down, uh, this is in the second block here. The vast majority of my administrative capacity is coming from pop jobs, and I don't think it's even an exaggeration to say that the vast majority of them are coming from this planet. Um, is it going to show us here? No. I don't think so. Um, but I'm producing a ton. Oh, here we go, right there at the bottom, modifiers. And first one there, 180 administrative capacity. That's being produced by these uh, administrative parks. What administrative capacity does is it's weighed against something called sprawl. Sprawl is generated, as you can see here, by districts, by systems, by colonies, that's planets occupied, and by pops. Um, 
systems grows very fast in the course of the early game and mid game, and then basically becomes static here. Um, districts goes, grows quickly in the early game and then slows down as you, I would say, as you continue to, to, to colonize, it probably remains constant. The rate of growth remains constant. Um, colonies, same thing. It, it's just a little bit every time you colonize, but it's pops that produce the majority of my sprawl here. Not the majority, the plurality. Plurality means more than anything else, but not necessarily more than everything else combined, which was the majority means. Um, and that growth basically increases over the course of the game. When your sprawl is higher than your administrative capacity, you will get scaling penalties to these two resources. Um, or, and not to the production of these two resources, but to the efficiency of these two resources. In other words, what will happen is when you're over your administrative capacity, this bar will have a, a requirement to, to research the technology that is higher, um, and that will be based on the ratio of the administrative capacity to the, uh, of the sprawl to the administrative capacity. Similarly here in Unity, um, this bar is going to get longer, not visually, but it's going, but the amount needed to get to the end of it is going to be higher if I'm over my sprawl, uh, if I'm, if I'm sprawling out away from my administrative capacity. So administrative capacity produces a limiter on your capacity to produce these, to, to output these high tier resources. And in order to, uh, bypass that limiter, in order to expand your, your limit, you need to spend additional consumer goods which is the resource needed to sustain the uh, bureaucrat jobs that produce that administrative capacity. As you can see here, each uh, administrator, each bureaucrat is going to be consuming consumer goods as part of its work. And what they're going to output is uh, administrative capacity. Second is star-based capacity. You get some of this from technologies and you have a baseline of three, but basically the rest of it is it's a tenth of your... Uh, of your of your number of systems so you don't need to worry that much about that this will go up over time as you colonize new systems then there's naval capacity um naval capacity represents the number of uh ships you can effectively field um there are many different tiers of ships and basically starting up from the corvette and going up to the titan basically each tier of ship above the Corvette costs about twice as much resources, twice as many resources, and costs about, and takes up double the fleet capacity, double the naval capacity of the ship that went before it. So in the beginning of the game, Corvettes cost about 100 alloys, and they take up one naval capacity in the base game when, you're, when your naval capacity is 20. Um, destroyers cost two naval capacity and cost about 200 alloys. Cruisers cost about 400 alloys, four naval capacity, etc., etc., etc. So on and so forth. The way you increase your naval capacity, uh, there are two ways. Uh, well, three ways. One is researching technologies. As you can see here, I have a technology called Doctrine Fleet Support which increases that number by 30. Another way is to build stations with anchorages, which increase my naval capacity. Um, these ones increase my naval capacity by actually six each, because I have this naval logistics office that makes the, these 50% better, but the baseline amount is four. Um, and this you get from a technology. See, so as you sort of talk, uh, hear me talk about this, you can see how all of these factors kind of interrelate to each other. Um, where you need star base capacity in order to build these star bases to, uh, to have these anchorage modules. And then there are technologies that let you, for example, unlock this building that can improve the capabilities of those anchorage modules. Um, however, the majority of the place that your naval capacity is going to come from when you are a more martially oriented civilization is from soldier jobs uh, and I don't think I've got any of those but basically they come from the fortress building Oop, 
zoomed out pretty far there. Uh, come from the fortress building down here, stronghold building, it upgrades into the fortress building. Um, and uh, those produce naval capacity. They are a worker to your job. So one of the things you can spend, uh, another things pops can do for your, uh, for your civilization are they can produce naval capacity. And that's the other side of the, uh, of the military side of this, the military civilian balance. So the civilian side is immunity and uh, research. And then the military side is alloys for ships and naval capacity to sustain them. Similar to Empire Sprawl, if you are over your naval capacity on your ships, there is actually a scaling penalty to maintenance cost for those ships. So what I'm talking about when I say maintenance cost is the consumed alloys here under ships, that's maintenance cost and alloys for my ships. And then the energy credits spent on ships here under consumed, that's the amount that my ships take uh, to support themselves. Um, if you're below your naval capacity, it's a flat value, but it will scale up pretty quickly if you're over naval capacity. And the amount of the penalty that will be applied is based on the ratio of the spent naval capacity, the, the, the size of the fleet, to the total naval capacity. Um, another thing I want to talk about is stations. In the vast majority of these systems, there's a... Yes, here we go. The vast majority of these systems have stations that are producing various things. For example, the Morgard station has, uh, has is it going to tell us? It has uh, stations producing energy credits. It's not showing us how many, um, but I can go there and you can see. Um, as you can see, we've got two stations, one here and one here, producing minerals. Two stations here and here, producing energy credits. One station over here, producing. This is engineering research. Stations have a flat cost of one energy credit each to sustain, a hundred minerals each to build. Um, and their outputs can be increased by increasing technological uh, capabilities. For example, again, using uh, as this as an example, zero G laboratories increases research station output. That's the type that produces research down here by 10%. Um, I know this says 2, but it's if you mouse over it, it says 2.4. So that is being calculated on these stations that produce only a small amount of research, even though it doesn't say it is. Finally, I'm going to talk about strategic resources. Um, you get the ability to, to uh, harvest these powerful resources late in, the, in not late in the game, in the mid-game. Um, and actually, you're doing really well if you can get them early. Uh, as you can see here, I, in this game, got them pretty early. So I'm having a lot of success uh, building up these large uh, reserves of these strategic resources because I got those technologies pretty soon. Um, strategic resources are vital to the continued mid and late game growth of your economy. Uh, and I'm going to show you why here. Each of these buildings uh, in this current row here, these civilian industries and uh, alloy foundries, produces only two jobs. Um, so there's only so many pops that can be employed in these buildings. In order to employ additional pops, you need to upgrade those buildings, which requires a technology to do. But as you can see here, the upkeep of these buildings is both in energy credits and in, that's exotic gases, is the is what it costs to sustain this building. Um, exotic gas is a strategic resource, and you don't have any of it at the beginning of the game. You have, you have exactly none and you it takes a long time for you to find those resources into the mid game maybe 50 years maybe closer to 75 depending on your your strategy um so those those are an additional sort of gate on your capacity to create high output economies and it is often uh wanton upgrading of buildings that leads to a top heavy economy that will, will begin to strain and crack because there's not many workers working these lower tier jobs. Um, and one of the things about the economy is that pops always want to be in a, in a higher tier if they can be. So if a ruler tier job gets created, pops are going to move up. Um, and if, if, for example, I were to replace 
this gene clinic with a, uh, for example, a... Do I not have the... With a mineral purification plant, this would produce minor jobs. Um, those pops would stay at tier two and be unemployed specialists for a bit, and that would create unhappiness in my civilization. They wouldn't demote down because they want to stay specialists if they can. Um, ruler tier pops take an even longer time to demote. So, uh, strategic resources, figuring out how to get them and making sure you've got enough to sustain your buildings is very important. There are basically three ways to get strategic resources. One is from stations. There are stations that will uh, produce strategic resources, such as, for example, here in the Azax system, I've got three stations producing uh, rare crystals. Uh, sorry, so to get back to it, the three uh, basic types of strategic resources are volatile moats, exotic gases, and rare crystals. Um, as you can see here, I've got these three stations, each producing one rare crystals each. Um, and that's per month. Uh, the second way is with job buildings that extract uh, strategic resource deposits from the Earth, from those different planets, using this building, the Crystal Mine, for example, which produces uh, a Crystal Miner job. And this Crystal Miner job produces two crystal strategic resources. You can see that, that job here, mining those crystals. The third method is by synthesizing them. And I don't know if I'm doing any of that yet, but let me, let me see if I am. I'm not, but um, there's also groups of buildings that produce these, these uh, resources. And, and the reason synthesizing is important is because this building, the moat harvesting trap, for example, I can't build this anywhere. Most buildings I can build anywhere. This one I can't. I can only build this here because I've got a special planetary feature called a dust cavern that allows me to build those moat harvesting traps. Um, and there are not that many of these uh, special planetary features. I mostly will not be able to produce these strategic resources using these types of jobs. Instead, I will need to synthesize them. Um, a synthesizer job excuse me, operates exactly the same way as a harvester job for these strategic resources, with the exception that it costs, uh, it produces the same amount of strategic resources too, um, but it costs 12 minerals. So this is another uh, thing you have to worry about with economy weight, weighting, where uh, if you build, if you find yourself in deficits of those strategic resources and you don't have new places you can harvest them, You'll need to synthesize them by spending minerals, and that will, will, in in many cases, if you're doing it on mass, lead to great strain of your mineral producing capability. I think that's oh trade. I haven't talked about trade yet, so that's that's mostly it. But um, I do want to go over trade because that's an important thing to know about. Um, trade is produced by worlds primarily, but it is also produced by uh, satellites, uh, by, by uh, deposits, natural deposits of trade value, which represent just sort of all the things we like to have, uh, all the nice things that can, be, that can be bought and sold in a civilization. Um, basically, the size of the economy of each planet determines how much trade value is produced. Uh, over in the Tarvalene system, I have a planet called uh, Shanathar which produces a large uh, amount of trade value because it's a highly populated planet, 51 pops. Istabak, on the other hand, is less populated and produces a small amount of trade value, 11. Um, I believe this is based on the amount of consumer goods being spent to sustain the pops, but this merchant also produces a bunch of trade value, produces eight trade value. Um, this trade value is collected by stations. Um, stations will always collect the trade value in the system they're in, but this station can collect uh, additional trade value using these trade hubs, uh, which will draw in trade value from additional jumps away, one for each hub. So this hub, this station has four trade hubs, so it will draw trade value from one, two, three, four systems away, 
And that's how it's getting all that trade value from the Tarvalene system. That trade value is then being sent in a trade route, shown here, to the capital, where it is turned into resources based on my trade policy. Um, there are three trade policies. The first is wealth creation, that's the default, and that's each trade value that makes it back to the capital produces one energy credit. There's consumer benefits, which is each one produces half an energy credit and a quarter of a consumer good. And there's marketplace of ideas, which is each one produces half an energy credit and a quarter of a unity. So trade seems really strong, but there's also a limiter on trade. It's not a capacity value like the other ones here. But here's what it is. As you can see, the Gardner uh, trade route we have somewhere here. Uh, where is Gardner? I can find it. It shouldn't be hard to find. Um, it's not getting all of its trade value to my capital here. Uh, it's only getting 81% of the trade value that it wants to get to my capital. Where is Gardner? Gosh. Gosh, friends. It's here. Um, so where's that trade value going? It is being stolen. It's being stolen by space pirates here in these four systems. Um, as you can see, we're having piracy effects in this system, this system, this system, and this system. Um, there's piracy here, but it's being protected by base protection and by defensive modules on these, uh, these stations here. But those defensive modules don't reach as far as these systems, and that's why we've got piracy here. Uh, in order to defend against piracy, you need to have light, small ships in these systems. Um, or, more effectively, really, you're going to want uh, stations with military modules like this. One doesn't have military modules. That was, that was smart. I'm smart. Like this one with these gun batteries. Uh, producing a radius of trade protection, uh, which reduces the effects of piracy. It doesn't reduce the growth of piracy, but it reduces the effects of piracy. That's why you've got, uh, for example, this this current piracy value uh, having the base protection subtracted from it, and that's why the piracy effects in this system is only zero minus uh, zero point one nine trade value. So I think that's basically everything. Um, that's all you need to know, or, or that's, that's the, the, the raw basics. I haven't, I haven't gone over everything. I haven't taken you through each of the building functions here, um, or, or much of this business here. Mm. I should go over this stuff. I'll do that in another video. I'll do a video on planetary management, but that's the basics of your overall Stellaris economy. Um, and with that, that's all the time I've got for this. I've had fun. I hope you've had fun. And I'll see you all on the other side.